start it up. Okay. Hey folks, can I have your attention? Hey everyone, shut up! Yeah, we'd like to get started. So, I'm just going to make a couple of quick announcements. Uh, if you haven't met me before, my name is Jessica. I'm one of the organizers. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so, a couple of things. Our uh, February project night is on the 8th of February, and there are still spots open. So, if you've never been to one, it's a lot of fun. It's a totally unstructured event. You come, eat free pizza, work on whatever you want. Uh, it's a great opportunity to meet fellow Pythonistas, work around an open source project, get help on something you're stuck with. It's also a great place for beginning Python programmers to get help. So that's February 8th. Uh, today, the 25th, is the final day for PyCon early bird registration. So if you are pretty sure you're going to PyCon, don't waste your money by not registering before the end of tonight. Uh, if you're not sure, you should, you should still go. And, you know, a ton of people from Boston are going to be there uh, just for fun, but also as presenters, as tutorial leaders, as sprint, you know, sprinting. So you're going to see a lot of friends from here there. I really encourage you to check it out. And that, again, is great for people of all experience levels. Uh, oh, Anastas is very kindly um, streaming this on. Tom, can you say a little bit about where you can view this on the web? So uh, we're streaming this on the Ustream. Uh, the channel name is Boston Python, as you would expect. Uh, hopefully, we'll make a habit out of it and maybe get some better setup, because this is kind of a ghetto phone <laughs> streaming. But thank you so much for, for doing this for us. Uh, other than that, you know, we are uh, in town Boston Python on IRC on Freenode, if you want to hang out in between events. And sponsorship tonight. Sponsorship for tonight, yeah. Uh, the pizza was bought by Lab 305. The pizza was bought by Lab 305. Do you want to say a couple of words now? <laughs> Thank you very much for your um, and, and actually, the speakers were purchased by Lab 305 as well. <laughs> in the pockets of Lab 305. And I think that's all I have to say. I didn't so. purchase these two, I just bought them. <laughs> Um, the one other thing to say is that after this, we'll be heading over to Mead Hall, yes. where Kairos is purchasing the first round of drinks. So you want to go there and get wasted with dudes or something. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I think that's all. I think that's all. Right. So I'll read the time tag for the fine gentlemen up here. Last week, actually, to see because I knew they were going to be in town to see if they'd get together and give a little panel discussion. So questions have been added through the moderator, um, Google moderator, and we'll go down that list later. But right now, I'd like each one of these fine gentlemen to introduce themselves, starting with Jacob. Hey folks, I'm Jacob Kaplan Moss. Um, I'm one of the lead developers of Django, um, one of the original creators. Um, I live in Florence, Kansas, where Django was originally created, uh, and there I am um, co-owner of a consultancy called Revsys, which is a part of Frank. Um, and uh, yeah, I live on a farm, I have a tractor, I talk to you about chickens, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Frank Wiles, uh, I obviously am kind of cool by association. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I actually was a pearl guy originally when he was working at the Ooh. same company. <laughs> <laughs> Now. Yay! Yay. <laughs> I saw the light, you know. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I, I'm probably most known in kind of the Python world for knowing a lot about PostgreSQL and performance. Hi, I'm Alex Gaynor. Um, I hack on Django and C Python and PyPy. Uh, I live in New Chicago or Troy, New York, for another few months. Um, yeah. Right. And I am Mike Trozen, I'm the I'm, president I'm of Lab 305, which is a consultancy very similar to what Jacob and Frank have. And I work primarily 900% Django. So that's what I do. Um, so this evening, like I said, we're here to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about, to ask these guys what their either expertise or whatever they might make up on various questions. And so. I think I'll, we'll just start with each one of you. What are your biggest pressing concerns that you're working on in the area that you're working on? So now, I know Jacob is one of the core contributors, the main guys for Django. <laughs> um, Frank, you're working in the business world, so how does that impact the business world? And Alex probably wants to talk about Pi Pi because it's all about <laughs> Excuse me? Ooh. I'm 
try to wave down the lights. Is any way you can turn the lights on in front? It's hard yep. to see you guys. And Jesse and all Yeah, the actually, we have, a, we have a surprise addition oh, to the panel. <laughs> You're not hiding in the back. Oh, yeah, get, you, get your butt down here. <laughs> and when Jesse gets down there, we'll make it work. He's mostly the thing with Tony and Zeus. That's not right. I have money. Whoa. It's too dark. It's too dark. Alright, that's too dark. That's too dark. Yeah. Uh, Alright, so I want everybody in this room to give a lot of recognition right here to this man because he does more for the pipe hunt community than anybody I know. So I want everybody to stand up. <laughs> That might work. Already? Are you serious? Holy crap. That's amazing. So I'll let Jesse. <laughs> so I'll let Jesse introduce himself real quickly. Everybody else will introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Jesse Miller. Uh, I'm a director of the Python Software Foundation. I also am the chair of PyCon for 2012, which is this year now, and 2013. Um, He's a hell of a guy. All right. So we were just going down the list. I wanted them to talk about the, the things that they're working on, the most concerning things in their world right now, whatever it is. So Jake and I are more in the business world. Jacob's in the making shit happen world, and Alex is pipeline. And you are pipeline. So like PyCon. What does it say about PyCon? PyCon 2012, Santa Clara, March 7th. Uh, to the 15th. Um, early bird registration closes at. Register midnight. now. Yeah, yeah, midnight tonight. Um, midnight anywhere in the world. Um, it's probably going to be. It, it actually, as of the numbers that I got on the drive over, uh, as of the numbers I got on the drive over, it will officially be the biggest PyCon that we've ever held uh, for the community as a whole. Um, we have over 112 sponsors, um, and I have four more pending in my inbox, um, and uh, it's going to be huge. We have 1,100 people already registered as of today. So, and that's a lot. So thank you. Very much. Standards around, you know, any place we need to do that. There's going to be 
um, uh, Chris McDonough of, uh, of the Pyramid Project is actually organizing a, a web summit at PyCon this year with getting basically a bunch of the maintainers of various Python web, web stuff into a room together. I'm really excited about that because I think that's an awesome sort of continuing of that of that process and sort of making sure that we stay, you know, we stay kind of part of the, you know, a, a subset of a bigger community, not kind of our own our own thing off over here. Right time. He'll talk all night long. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Jessica. Actually, one of the things to be proud of inside of the community, as Jacob has said, and I've seen this more and more on the direct level, running PyCon, et cetera, is that PyCon as a community has actually been able to avoid, or largely avoid, the set, uh, the individual sects within it kind of splitting off into their own subgroups. I mean, we saw it with Zoke to a certain extent, but Django, Django Secret Weapon has always been that it is just PyCon. Uh, this holds true to Twisted and everything else like that. All of our communities tend to be fairly well integrated with one another, and they're all sitting there saying we are Python users, and they tend to identify more and more as they as they get more experience, they tend to identify more and more with that, rather than saying, I'm just a Django developer, that's all I want. Uh, they tend to branch out into the greater community, which is actually beneficial to all of us. And um, Django has to be commended for especially kind of espousing that, which is its secret weapon is that it is just Python. There's not a lot of magic here, and you know, go forth and be married. Anymore. Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it was removed. <laughs> Took it out back and shot it. <laughs> All right, Frank, do you want to? Um, yeah, I think from the business side, the I would really encourage people to go out and try, you know, and, and get out there and label yourselves as Django and Python developers. It is incredibly hard to find Django and Python developers. All of our clients are having trouble finding people in Silicon Valley, in the Midwest, in Chicago, in Boston. Everybody is having trouble finding good developers. And these kinds of groups are good ways to network, find out who's hiring, get to know people a little bit. You know, sometimes maybe because of your job, you can't contribute to open source as much, or you don't have time. So you don't really have you know, the most impressive, say, GitHub account. But you know you can you know, turn some turn some heads in a group like this, and that ends up getting you you know a really good job. And I second that a lot. A lot of my clients are in the same position. And they come to me because they can't find data developers. And our two companies probably make up 50% of the Jacob Consulting world. <laughs> so you know there's not a lot of consultants out there. Yeah. <laughs> We're both not that big, but we are very good. We pretty soft. We can go on a private jet. <laughs> That's where the DSF well, money goes. <laughs> well, I'm not thinking crying. But also to point out, the fact is, is that if you're if you're in this room and you're not and you don't know Django, um, take take a couple of weekends, ramp up on it because trust me, the skills for Python developers are in strong, very strong demand, and it's almost impossible to hire good ones. Um, and then Python and Django, I mean, just pick it up and you'll go, there are lots of jobs like this. Right, and so there, I see a lot of this where people time. say they're Python programmers, but they don't say they're Django programmers. You know Python, you can pick up Django pretty damn quick. So put yourselves out there a little bit. I mean, you also could, you could be a database person in Python and not know anything about web development. Don't say you're a web developer because then I'm going to have to fix your crap that you wrote. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. Alex? So probably the number one thing I'm interested in improving in the Python world right now is uh, analytics, monitoring, and like statistics. I think uh, the Python community is really severely lacking. In, uh, like if you look at like the monitoring tools, something like the JDM has, they blow away what Python has, and I want to fix that because I want to not just know, you know, is my web server up and how fast are my requests returning? I want to know if like my templating got slow. I want to know like what function goals are slow. I want that information at my fingertips and easy and like awesome. And I want that for like every Python, every every web framework, everyone to have these sort of tools available. Great. All right, so this is more generated as conversation towards the Python world, but I'm gonna let you talk about Django if you wanted to. Um, over the next couple of years, what do you feel are the biggest challenges either in the Python or Django world? Um, go. I think the number one challenge is uh, probably going to be Python 3 and alternative Python interpreters, uh, just remaining cohesive as a community in terms of the rise and the porting of stuff to Python 3 and the rise of PyPy and Jython and IronPython and anything else. 
sort of keeping ourselves sort of a one community. Jesse talked about that we've stayed that so far, but as sort of there become more alternatives, can we keep that up? I think it's the number one thing. I would think kind of in general of level of quality as communities get bigger and you have more and more people, um, it, you can get some bad actors, you know, some uh, some assholes, if you will, in a community. And uh, I think that you know the Python community in general doesn't have those and doesn't tolerate those. But it, as you get bigger and bigger, it gets kind of harder to I don't want to say police it, but police that kind of kind of thing. I, I can't think of any other thing that really, from my perspective, is a big challenge for the next few years. I think we got to level up our packaging system, guys. Like, it's, em agree. it's embarrassing. We like we have tools and they're adequate. And that's really the best thing I can say about it. Like, they're OK and they work mostly. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be saying that about our packaging ecosystem in a couple of years. Like, this is it's a big deal and it bites new users and it bites old users and it makes us look bad that we can't get our act together and do something that looks awesome and works really well and doesn't go down and all Uh, I have a second one Alex said. Um, one of the big challenges that we're going to have moving forward is actually integration, uh, well, meaning the cohesiveness and uh, the cooperation between the various implementations. So uh, you have to remember it's like CPython has been the dominant dog in the interpreter realm for a very long time, but now more and more PyPy is becoming a viable solution, and we need to continue to work on, with both teams in Jython and IRPython to keep everyone integrated and kind of working together. Uh, because as CPython continues to be the reference implementation, the other implementations are going to individually rise to their um, to what their core benefits are. And having that interactivity between the teams, like PyPy feeding changes into CPython, CPython developers kind of getting out of the rut and going to PyPy, so on and so forth. Um, I also add uh, the aging out of the community. Um, this is actually something that is kind of near and dear to my heart as I read my daughter's uh, Python programming books at night. Um, but, <laughs> but the fact is, is that we have, to, we have to get more students, we have to get more people involved, and I see this on the board, I see this on CPython, we see a lot of the same developers, myself included, responding to things, getting involved, etc. But there's only, there's only so many resources of that nature that can go around. Um, and so we have to start reaching out more and more and bringing more people into contributing just to not just little key Python, the big key Python community, the interpreters, Django, everything. We have to get more people involved. I agree, because I want to hire them. <laughs> <laughs> um, going back, so I like this question a lot that was put on the moderator list, big data, and how does that, how does it work in the Python and Django world? Data is growing at astronomical leaps and bounds of the amount of data that's out there. How do you, or have you had to deal with situations where the amount of data that you have is large and how did you handle it? I keep asking people to tell me when data gets big. <laughs> <laughs> no one can actually explain to me like where, you know. So let's well, I don't know if I've used big data. So let's start with this, a database that's four terabytes large. Doesn't sound that bad. I mean, is it normal? No, I, I think one of the things <laughs> <laughs> is No, oh, actually, it's actually you go well. back and you get all the blowout of that. <laughs> I, I think that one of the things about one of the things I really admire about the Python community is that while we, we we clearly have made a choice in what language we use, we're not dogmatic about it. And so when tools come along that deal with this, that deal with some particular problem well, we're we're happy to use them. So most Python programmers have an awesome answer to big data problems. They use Hadoop like everyone else does, and maybe they maybe they wire things up so they can use um, Python with it. You know. I, um, Yelp has that tool, Mr. Job. There's, you can use Jython with it. I mean, there's you know a few different options, but maybe they just suck it up and write some Java. Like, there are, there are there are some problems that the tooling in Python isn't particularly good, and I'm not sure I see the point in like reinventing Hadoop in Python just so that it'll be in Python. Like, if we can bring something new to the table, by all means. And if you look at some of the stuff that like IPython is doing, the latest version of IPython with their um, storable interactive document in the cloud craziness. I mean, it's 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 some crazy stuff, but it's freaking cool, and it's bringing and it's bringing sort of you know cluster computing power kind of right down to the desktop in a really interesting way. So you know, we are we are bringing stuff to the table, and where we're not, there are 
this open source is awesome, we can reach out to these other side views. So I, I don't know, it doesn't concern me that much. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, there's the Dumbo, isn't that what it's called? There's the uh, Hadoop interface for Python, I think it's yeah. called Dumbo. And, uh, and uh, there's, you know, you can use React and Cassandra and all sorts of things to do, you know, scale out data. And you can do all those things from Python. I don't, I don't really see that there's any particular <coughs> problem in, in Python and big data. Yeah. Google uses a lot of Python. <laughs> this yeah, I'm far from a big data expert, but I mean the whole point of you know when you have sufficient data, you need multiple machines, and and then like you can throw away that you know Python isn't the fastest because you're already building on you know 20 machines. 2x doesn't matter at that scale, so I think Python's just fine. I, I, just that this seems to be a classic Python response to problems that other <laughs> communities seem to make really big deal about things and I don't know if they know that there's something big going on that we're just kind of ignoring or if they're just sort of these hype magnets that want to label their latest problems so that they can be excited about it whereas we're just like yeah okay it's a lot of data let's get to work and <laughs> 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 but, that, but that's a very good thing uh, or that's a very good point which is I mean right now there's this gigantic hype machine chasing this big data thing and I mean you can, you can kind of see the profiteers floating into that, right? <laughs> it's like they've got their little flags up and they're all going towards big data. Mm -hmm. And Python, cla uh, Python classically, the response has always been, yeah, we have some tools that will help you out there. I mean, you know, for speed, go to PyPy. For, you know, individual processes, use multiprocessing or use, you know, a billion other packages that do the exact same thing. Um, you know, go out, use these tools. We have these components. You can build basically whatever you want. We've got these Legos. Um, we don't chase the hype machine as much, um, and you don't see that burn within the community as much as you do with other communities tend to chase the, the shiny ball across the road and get hit by the car. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, it, it's really Python. One of the core tenets of the community has always been use the right tool for the job. And if Python isn't that tool, I mean, look at C Python. If it's slow, build a C module, right? I mean, that has been from, that is, from day zero, that has been the thing of, if you find your code is slow, use a C module, right? That, that's a very pragmatic. And overall, Python as a whole, as a language, as a community, has always been, been value pragmatism. You know, get the job done with the tools that you can. Don't just do it just because you know you're being religious about it, or you're being you know, oh everything has to be in Python, right? Just use the right tool. I do think though. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna, sorry, sorry, <coughs> but I do think I do think you. Um, I do think that is something the Python community that's a weakness that we have that we're we're very we're uncomfortable about advertising. We're uncomfortable about self promotion. You know, and and, um, and this is true. <laughs> this is true of all, all open source communities to some mm -hmm. extent, right? Yes. But it's it's more um, true of the Python yeah, community than exactly. a lot of them. Yeah. Right. Maybe it's there's room for us to kind of, we you know, maybe we need to be get a little more comfortable about. It's a classic engineer's market. flaw. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> we do cool stuff, and we don't really want to talk about it. <laughs> right. Are, Michael, are we taking? Oh, I think there's a guy. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I actually. Last program that you gave a talk about uh, uh, what Python programs on how to do mm -hmm. and some of the things that you did. But how to kind of use the interface called the how to streaming. On streaming, mm -hmm. you don't have to use Java. You can use any language you want. We have to choose Python. Uh, one of the things which is really nice uh, in Python was that uh, there's this uh, module called Tokyo Cabinet, mm -hmm. which, ha has, which has very large capacity, so much bigger than. Uh, Say Python dictionary for lookup. So, so, so I want to mention these things. Maybe in the future, I'll give us a talk here. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. <coughs> now, I was just going to say sort of the flip side of what you said. Like, we're not dogmatic. We don't have to use a Python tool. We're happy to use something else. We, I'm pretty sure Python is a freaking awesome tool. And if at all possible, I would love everything with Python. So, I mean, I think if we can yeah. build a better tool, let's, let's build a better tool. Yeah, but don't spend it all day long yak shaming. Because there's really a lot of news. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. I saw the move on the next one. One, one, 
Really All right, right. Watch, watch Glyph's keynote oh, at yeah, JagoCon yes. this last year. He gave a very interesting and really um, very strong and somewhat controversial argument that like your entire stack from top to bottom should be Python. And he actually you know, explains why. And it, it, it's, the, it's the counter argument to the argument we're all making, and it's actually a very persuasive one, so you should you should watch it. Awesome. So this next one moves away from technology a little bit. How do you balance your contributions to the open source world while at the same time working for a full product company? We're actually kind of in a cool spot because a lot of times uh, we are building stuff for clients who are fairly open about being open. And so we can say, hey, you know, if we built this little module kind of as a standalone, we can open source this. And it's not your secret sauce. It's just kind of some scaffolding, some infrastructure around your secret sauce. This isn't going to hurt you. It's not going to really help your competitors. And, and we can make the argument that opening it has some benefits for them, or at least no detriments. So a lot of times our for-profit work ends up coming out, and sometimes it's open source. I'm going to just interject that that's a great way for companies that may not be the flashiest of all companies that like the top rate engineers might want to go work for. If some of these guys like Alex sees this little Joe Schmo company releasing some really good software packages to the open source world, that might make Alex consider working for a company like that, which helps a lot with recruiting. Yeah, I mean, I would say like pretty much all of our, almost, I can't think of any exceptions to the you know, the statement that all of our gigs turn into some sort of open source contribution, anywhere from a patch to like something larger. Like we, we just sort of <coughs> almost assume it's part of doing business that we're going to discover deficiencies in the open source world and we're going to fix them. And what's been what's interesting is that our clients don't have pushback on that. Like we say, hey, we're going to release this thing. Oh yeah, okay. It, it isn't it isn't the type of argument I think it was, you know. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, and very, very rarely does somebody say, "Yeah, I'm not going to sign your contract because you know." Oh, it's, right. we have that in yeah, we have we have in the contract <laughs> that if any patches or anything to anything that's open source, we'll release it back to the community, basically irrespective of license. Um, so, so that kind of helps. You know, a lot of times they don't know what they're signing, and so sometimes <laughs> we just kind of go do it, and, and, and uh, they, they don't know. And they don't this care. is being recorded. You yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's just an inspiration for a talk. Sometimes it's inspiration for a blog post. You know, you're working with a client that's got a team of developers and they're having some kind of problem, not even necessarily technical, maybe it's a management problem, and that turns into a blog post or, or a talk or something like that. Yeah, and so the way that my company does this, because I have no time in the world, I work way too much, the way that I do is I sponsor things. I buy pizza for meetup groups, I'm a sponsor for PyCon, I've been a two-year sponsor for DangoCon. And Jesse's done an amazing job this year. And actually, I don't know if he guilts him into it. I don't know what his secret sauce is, but of reaching out there and getting companies to give back to the community, even though they're not open source companies, you can give back in many, many different ways. Even as a, a student in college, you can give back. You know, give five dollars to the PSF. You know, it's not going to kill you. And I know Ned was talking about it, so I wanted to talk about it a little bit right now about a donation page for something. So you want to speak about it? Um, we have a donation page for Boston Python, um, which is actually a PSF page. So we have a link, bostonpython.com slash donate, which will actually take you to a PSF page where you can make a tax deductible donation to the PSF that's earmarked to reimburse Boston Python expenses. So if you like what Boston Python's doing and you think we should, for instance, buy a better camera or buy a better pizza or <laughs> buy better speakers or whatever we should be doing <laughs> with money, <laughs> um, whatever we, we could do with money, you could go to bostonpython.com slash donate and donate some money to the PSF for us. Um, that's yes. all I got to say. So that's, that's a great way. Like, I, I really don't have time. I don't have time to come to a lot of meetings and make presentations. Not that anybody would want to hear what I have to say anyways. But that's how I get back. And I think it's appreciated by everybody that I get involved with. And you know, it works for me. Presumably, Mike, there's a, I 
I mean, I know you're a good guy, and I know you want to give back out of the you know goodness of your heart, but there is also a business case. And one hundred percent. And you were you were frank. You know, talk about that so that people kind of. It's good to have that talking point, even if you're not a business person, to take back to your managers and explain why they should and do it. And the way he's thinking at there is because of my contributions, I believe, and because I'm a nice guy, to the Django community, I know I bet you 95% of the core Django developers, and I could consider half of them friends of mine. And so I know if I have a problem in my company with software, or I know that if I know someone that's having a problem, I can go, you know what? I know the guy that wrote that software package. <coughs> Lindsley wrote this guy. I know I can call him up on the phone, pick him on IRC, and he's going to go out of his way to help me. And that's a value for my clients because I can go to them and say, you know what, I don't know the answer to that, but I know the guy that does. And that works twofold. Now I know that if Daniel Lindsley's ever looking for a job and they don't hire him first, I'll hire him. And so I'm going to get the top talents because I've worked with them in the past. They know how I run my business because I've been talking to them for the last two, three years. And I'm going to beat out, you know, the meetup.coms for that talent, even though I'm a small company. And it, it, the, the business case, they, it's time and time again, it's I've only ever worked for proprietary software companies. I know, boo to me. Um, but but the business case, is, it, the business case is very simple, right? So no one, no one in this room probably has 20% time, like the Google Epoch Magic Sauce. You get 20% free time to do whatever you want. Um, almost none of us get that. Um, but, you know, I walk into my boss's office and I'm like, you know what, listen, this isn't core IP, this isn't, you know, core data path, this isn't anything else like that, can I give it back? And typically his answer is like, sure, because he does see the fact that that gives me the ability to say, hey, listen, you know, I push a patch up to this, or I know the maintainer of Fabric because he and I talk a lot and, you know, we've contributed patches, or, you know, I know Dave Malcolm at Red Hat, and if I have a problem with, you know, the GDB extensions, I can get him on the horn. The bit is, it, there's hard, there's hard contributions like money, patches, things like that. Then there's also, you know, the social contributions that you get just by being part of the community, and it's easy to make that case to your boss. Um, and it's easy to say, listen, this is very tangible for us, and it benefits us to be able to give back. I think a, a good example, if you need one for your boss, is the German world, where Janko came from. I mean, a lot of these names, these people were throwing around, worked or worked at the journal world. And the reason they come there, most of them aren't from Lawrence, Kansas. The reason they came there was because they got involved in Django and wanted to work at the home of Django with other cool Django people. And it, not that your necessarily small little app that you're releasing is going to, you know, draw that much attention. But that's a good example of they're not understanding how that can benefit. And so one of the other questions on moderator list was, how do I, as a person not associated with any of these groups, get involved, contributing in some way? Like, what are the steps that I would have to do to become a contributor to Django or to work on PyPy or to be friends with Jesse Rowling? Just as easy, you can buy his friendship. <laughs> <laughs> Just have a sponsor by code. <laughs> Pay for babysitters. <laughs> I mean, I think the thing to do, you know, for all of them is to, you, you find something that you're good at, and 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 you apply those skills to to that project. So if you're if you're good at writing code, obviously you contribute code. But I think that's why most people feel intimidated about getting involved with open source because they think that's the only way they can contribute. And they, and you know, Django is a big project. There are, there are parts of it. I have to spend a lot of time thinking about if I want to contribute. They're actually difficult for me, and I'm supposedly a maintainer. PyPy intimidates the crap out of me. But you can. But it's pretty bad. <laughs> How many gigs of RAM does it take to run the translate? Like yeah, you know, I, but I've, you know, I've never, I've never compiled C Python. I, I, I don't even know if I have the source code checked out anywhere. I know, but I, but I still consider myself a mild contributor to core Python development because I, you know, I hang out on some mailing lists that, <laughs> I, you know, I hang, I hang out on some, uh, on, on, you know, the mailing lists that concern things that interest me. So I'm, I'm on, I'm on the web sig, which doesn't get a lot of. In traffic, but you know, I, I hang out on the, the Python developers mailing list, and once in a while something comes up involving <coughs> that touches on web development, and I'll say, 
hey, we should do that, or no, please don't do that, or sort of make a contribution that way, or make suggestions that way. So you can be involved just by sort of voicing your opinion and helping design things. You can get involved by just using tools and writing about it. I mean, one of the ways a lot of people start out getting involved in a community is, wow, I wonder if I can use Python and Hadoop. Hey, I can. Let me write a blog entry about how that works. And hey, now you're a contributor, right? I mean, this is important stuff, right? So I think the main point is just to sort of find something that you enjoy and just do it and apply to it. The weird thing about open source is that almost nobody ever asks for permission. And if you do, it confuses people. So you just need to sort of go. So from the Boston Python perspective, at our project nights that we run every month, we've helped a bunch of people contribute to open source software for the first time. So if you've never done this before and this is something that interests you, you should definitely come to these and we can help you out. And there's a specific project you might want to contribute to. There's also the community aspect and the tools around open source development. We can help with both of that. And in fact, a bunch of the maintainers for the OpenHatch project, if you go to openhatch.org, are a part of this user group. And that is a project specifically designed to help people get introduced to contributing to open source. And they have training missions to help practice the utilities that you often use, like Git and Patch and the Ruby control system. So if that's interesting to you, please definitely check it out and come talk to me or any of the other helpers at the project nights about that. The other thing I want to say is one of the things that we've been talking So I'm a Twisted maintainer, if you've heard of that project before. There are a bunch of Twisted folks in Boston. And what we want to do sometime in 2012, probably after Python, is run a Twisted sprint with this user group that has a component at the beginning that is like how to get involved for real for the first time. So keep an eye out for that, because that's something we've been talking about doing maybe in March or April, which is going to be really exciting. That's awesome. Are you going to talk about Python mentors? Because I won't say it. Well, I was going to say it's like, no way now. No. Oh, that cat's on. So like Jacob said, there's a lot of it. Find what you're passionate about. Open source is 99.9% passion, 1%, oh god, why does this do what I need it to? You're a better programmer than I am, because I used to be. He's a better programmer than he is. But I mean, so passion is a large aspect. So if your passion is doc writing, god, everything needs better docs. Everything. All the things. If you have any type of design skills at all, every open source project needs a designer. Even docs, don't be discouraged by the difficulty of writing docs. There are lots of projects that could just use fixing the typos and the English grammar and the sentences they already have. Yes. And I, I, don't mean that, I don't mean that as a joke. I mean, that is true. This, yes. It is the world wide web, and there are people all around the world writing in English that could use some help. And they're not afraid to get typos and things fixed. And you can contribute that way. I mean, design, docs, code, just whatever your passion is, whatever you think that, hey, listen, I saw a Django tutorial that was incorrect. I mean, just. Go say, here's a fix, have a nice day. Um, and then there's there's mentorship groups. There's Open Hatch. There's the Python mentorship group, which is a mentorship group designed around getting people directly involved in maintaining Python, the language. And it's basically, you sign up to the mailing list, and there's a bunch of people there, myself partially included, um, who will walk you through getting your first patch committed. And we've gotten probably, I'd say, a good 20 to 25 additional contributors over the time, just talking them through, just working them through. Find mentorship groups. Just find what you're passionate about and chase it. Because everyone's welcome. Yeah, I, I mean, the number one way to contribute to open source is show up. I mean, all these communities are, like, it's 99.9% .9 volunteers. So, you know, they're, they're scrapped for time. There's nothing we want more than another person lending a helping hand to doing all the work we have. Like if there's a bug that hasn't been fixed, a feature that isn't uh, isn't the thing you want, it's like a 2% chance it's not there because it's a bad idea, and a 98% chance it's not there because someone hasn't had the time for it yet. You can be the first with the time. There's a there's a saying that you know open source operates on rough consensus and working code. And and that that applies even when you're not talking about code. Like the way things happen in open source communities is because someone does them. There. 
most of the time arguments about the best way or the right way or the you know all, all those sorts of arguments just disappear when when faced with something that's done. So it, you know, yeah, it's, it's, pretty much. But but yeah, I mean, it's in the, and this is I think this is actually the big, the big change that that actually I think keep a lot of people away from contributing to open source because it's it's the inverse of how a lot of a lot of other types of contributions normally operate. You know, the, the way that you might think it would work normally is like you, you ask someone what to do, they tell you to do something, you, they tell you how to do it, you go and do it, and now, you know, now everyone's happy. That, that's very unlikely to happen in, in, in open source communities. And, and these mentorship groups are great because they bring some, some structure to people who want to contribute but don't really have a strong feeling about how. But most of the time, you know, in, in the absence of that, the best way to contribute is just is just to do it. And I'm just going to add a little bit before we move on. Give constructive criticism. Uh, Eric Florenzo is really good at this. He gets in front of Django, and in front of Django kind of says everything that's wrong with Django, right? And it actually does have positive effects on the community. It lets Alex Gator be a core contributor to Django, you know, <laughs> things like that. But don't come on and just troll people. If it pisses me off, it pisses other people off, you're going to get negative results from that. But if you come and say, hey, there's a better way to do this. Can we, what, what about this? Have you thought about this type of approach? And a lot of times people will say, yeah, we thought about that, but these are the issues. Or they'll be like, that's a great idea, run with it. You know, And that's your step into, right? Don't just bitch about it. Do something about don't, it. Don't, don't, if, you're, if your blog post or if your email ends with, is it ghetto? <laughs> Delete it. <laughs> Wax guys, right? Do it constructively. Say, hey, listen, you know, here's an idea. And yes, people are going to jump on you and they're going to be like, oh, you know, I thought about this back when wheels were first invented. And you know, <laughs> Zoke did it first. And, you know, it, it's like our equivalent of Simpsons did it, isn't it? <laughs> it's like uh, Twisted has six knees. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're going, to, you're going to get that, but just be constructive and people will listen. Right. So what's the deal with Python 3? What's going on? In general, when is Django going to get to Python 3? Uh, actually, there, there is already a working um, branch of Django working on Python 3. It's, it's not in our repo right now um, for, for process reasons, but it's a branch, not a fork. It's, it's kept being kept up to date. Um, uh, uh, Vinay, what's his last name? Sanjeev. It, it's Sanjeev did. So it's, it's, a, it's a core Python contributor yeah. as well, right? Yeah, he, 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 he picked up some work done by Martin and Lois, who picked up some work done by some, some students. I mean, so there's been a sort of line of it. And right now, you can download a, a version of Django that works on Python 3, and I, I, I've tried it out. You can get through the tutorial as long as you are sort of translating 2 to 3 in your head a little bit in the examples. If it works, it runs, things work. It's, it's clearly not done. I would not dream about putting it into production. Um, but the, the reason it's not in, the reason it's not like available in 1.4 is purely a timing thing. It's just sort of too late in our release process to merge something that big in. But this is my number one priority for 1.5. I, I want Django 1.5 to ship with, and we'll call it like experimental, I don't know, something, <coughs> but it, Django 1.5 will work to some extent with Python 3. And then we'll need the community to tell us where it doesn't, and, and, and we'll fix that. I don't, I don't really know, you know what the timeline is before you can actually be putting that stuff in production, but you can be testing this stuff pretty soon, even today if you want to. The other reason Saturn one for is if you one four supports uh, Python two five, right. and if you having a source compatible uh, tree for two five and three dot x is considerably more ugly than having a source compatible tree for two six and three x. Yeah, we're doing we're doing a, an interesting, I mean, interesting to me approach. It wasn't the one that I considered. Um, yeah. the, the the patch doesn't branch whatever. It doesn't use two to three. There's, it's actually a single source compatible with both Python 2 and Python 3, which as a, as a maintainer makes me much happier because it means I only have to deal with one patch instead of like porting patches or something crazy like that. So it, it, it's an approach that has me feeling pretty pretty optimistic about it. We're, we're rapidly reaching the moment where we're going to see more and more libraries porting 
Um, actually, if you watch the trends over the past year, you'd see more and more things like WebAuth, PyOpenSSL, et cetera, beginning to support uh, Python 3. Pip and virtual end. <coughs> yep, Pip, Pip virtual end. Um, you know, more and more we're seeing this. And everyone has to remember that the core development team, when, when everyone kind of sat around and said, okay, so what's the timeline on moving over to this? No one sat there and said, okay, everyone's going to move in a year. Like, no, this was more like, okay, five years, you know, we'll start seeing some of the bigger libraries move over, you know, and, you know, we'll see the adoption. I mean, it's important to be patient. I can speak as somebody who's been dealing with a lot of money and a lot of sponsors. You're seeing, I'm seeing personally more and more companies express interest in Python 3 and actually be willing to give money to porting to Python 3. The PSF is actually included in this. We will give you a grant. We, we will hand you money. So they have large checks. Alex knows. I can I can order a more large cardboard check. <laughs> uh, the the PSF will specifically fund. You know, if you say, listen, I want to port X to Python 3, we'll sit there and say, excellent. Here's some money. Um, and you know that is that's true of companies now too. More and more companies are saying, hey, listen. We are willing to fund this, so we're hitting we're hitting that threshold year, and in theory, 2012 is uh, where we're going to see kind of you know more momentum as Python 3 itself, when it first came out, was actually relatively immature, and there were a lot of rough edges that we had to iron out as a core team. I mean, if you downloaded Python 3.0, kind of sketchy, uh, <laughs> but it was a .dot .o, so. Uh, but Python 3.2, Python 3.3, there. Number one, there's a ton of features in there. Um, there's a ton of features like the enhanced generators that are coming, etc. There's more and more impetuous to move into Python 3 because there are actually features that are bringing you there. And it's also a lot better. We've ironed out a lot of the kinks, made it a lot smoother, made it faster, so on and so forth. I so. think, I mean, I think it's going to be, you know, it, it's interesting. It was interesting to listen to you list off the packages that have been reported, you know, like, PyOpen SSL, PIP, virtual end, you know, NumPy. NumPy. What all of these things have in common is they're, they're, they're sort of foundational, yep. right? Like you really can't, I can't think about doing, you know, um, uh, uh, Python 3 development with, without, you know, PIP, right? Like that's just not kind of, it, it, it sort of doesn't work. It kind of breaks down at the first levels for me, you know? And, and you know, those things are mostly done for the, for the most part, sort of the foundational stuff, you know? And, now everyone's kind of starting to work on the next layer, which are you know frameworks like Django and you know and and lar you know larger libraries like I don't know I'm, I'm Matplotlib. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I Python works on Python three now. I think maybe I don't know, but yeah. but those are sort of like these. We're still not we're still that not up at the level. Of Alex. <laughs> yes. We're still not up at the level of like your your apps. Like we're not up, up at like the, you know the websites are not aren't up there yet, but. That's you know, nice. that's that's the next right. So we, it's going to kind of be this this process of building on top of things, and it, you know, it is going to be a slow process. And I I, I I alternate between being, you know, excited and optimistic about it, and also a little scared because there's going to be a time when we're all going to have to have our feet in two camps, and that's not going to be a huge amount of fun. But I think you know, I feel like that there's a steady cadence of moving to Python three, and we haven't. It doesn't feel like it's stalled. It feels like it, it's moving slowly, but it feels like it's moving consistently and sort of surely, and maybe accelerating a bit. But I, I, the consistency and the and the, the steady movement makes me feel pretty good about it. Ironically, one of the biggest attributes of the community, which is <laughs> slow, steady movement <laughs> into the future. I, um, did you add? Well, what were some of the issues of doing a single source for you to run on both? Uh, so on two, uh, if you want to have a source that's compatible with Python 2.5, the biggest issue is... Not 2.5, 2.67.3, which is what? 267, having 2.6.2.7.3 is not terribly difficult. Most of that is handled by like something, some modules are imported under different names. Mm -hmm. That's relatively easy. Like the syntax is all totally compatible there. Well, so. there's a few differences. Right. Like, the, the Unicode, <coughs> the big one is around Unicode string handling. So what? 
what um, my favorite. There's a library yeah. called Six. Yeah. Two, two and three, six. Yeah. Really cute. Why was it six and not five? Multiplication. <laughs> Multiplication is more powerful than addition. Because <laughs> five was already uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, it was so already was eight. It should be called eight. eight so I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but if you look, if you look at what it does, it, it exposes little little functions like b and u and uh, an s, I think, or something like that. And so b is a way of marking something as a byte string in a way that both Python two and Python three are compatible. So you take a little bit of a speed hit, right, in these things. And, and I actually think one of the, one of the places where we can be looking to make this better is to we either switch to PyPy and then like the JIT is magic and that all goes away. <laughs> I, 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 as far as I understand, it's a technical explanation for how JITs work. Um, or, or, or I think that, I think there's a lot of room for that to become a, a C module to make that separately fast. But, um, you but, but regardless, you do you do sort of have to annotate your code a little bit, and there are other there are other helpers in that in that sort of library that would like. You know, tell you where to find HTTP lib, for example. You know, so you end up with a little compatibility shim, which makes the code. There's a little bit of a code smell to it. When I when I first looked at the at the patch, I was kind of like, eh. But it's not it's not bad if you don't have to support two five. So, so, <laughs> so you started with two. How much work did you have to do to make it to sprinkle three around? It's hard to say because it was sort of done by a bunch of people over you know, many sort of spurts and sprints, but I, I really don't think it was more than like total a couple of weeks of work for Django's entire, you know, code base. And that, you know. So uh, for reference, I know both pip and virtual end were ported in a single PyCon sprint. So it's four days <coughs> of porting. Yeah, the, the average is maybe a week. Uh, uh, for most when, of these when you say ported, was that? Again, single Same source. Same single source. Yeah. So is this is this kind of becoming the, the de facto? I mean, like, I, I don't really know. Of course, I've seen it was when Vinay proposed for Django. Um, is, this, is this becoming is this standard or like what's it? I think David can back up on this. I think. Yeah. yeah. I, I think this is the way we should all be doing it. <laughs> for me, two to three, two to three is so much like using going back to C plus plus that I, um, <laughs> because your edit can you basically have an edit compile run. Debug and it's yeah. something in this compilation phase that um, takes time and it, you know it's, it slows you down in terms of that iterative development process. Two to three was a mistake. So can we get so can we get something like six into into core Python somehow? I know two seven is supposedly the end of the line, but if we get a two seven plus that has six in it, I mean, why do we need six? Is what? there a way? Packaging's not that broken. Yeah, it's not that broken. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but then how is it available in two dot six dot? Yeah. Right. Or yeah. If, if the task of upgrading from 2.6 to 2.7 is mostly an ops issue, not a not a code issue, right? Well, unless you're on Yeah. <laughs> if, if any of you have hard, even harder source code compatibility requirements, coverage.py is single source that runs on 2.3 through 3.3. Madman. Madman, yes. I don't have deal that much with strings, which made it a lot easier. Yeah. But no. yeah. Yeah, and Django, the reporting Django was made somewhat easy by the fact that we we sort of were all Unicode internally and sort of you know byte strings at the boundary, and we actually established really hard rules around our handling of Unicode um, a while ago, like before 1.0, I think. You know, yeah. and so um, and so if if you're at the, the place that's going to bite you with Python 3s, if you're sloppy about strings in Unicode, if you don't know looking at your code whether this thing is a string or a unicode, a byte string or a unicode, and, and you're mixing and matching all around, work on your test coverage for a while. Because <laughs> that, that's where it gets a bit tricky. And if you, if you don't know that stuff, come to the rehearsal night, uh, February 29th, when I'll be doing the practice run of my PyCon talk entitled, Pragmatic Unicode, or How Do I Stop the Pain? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody should play attend that because it is a whole <laughs> Yeah, no, I've been waiting for like a question. I can stick it in the right tests. Like you need them if you're porting to Python 3, if you're porting to PyPy. Anytime you're changing sort of any infrastructure, you're all creating your Django version, you need tests to so know it can break. Please write them. Yes or just no? It's whatever. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're going to switch gears a little bit again. Um, I don't know how many of you all know. What, what was that question you were answering? <laughs> I'm Where were you? <laughs> yeah, right. Now we're going to do a fly fly, so it's not going to work. We were answering. We ran out of questions. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so way back in the day, there's a couple of guys involved with Django, Adrian Pavarotti and Jacob, but then Adrian disappeared into the magic beyond, and now he's back. How do you feel, how does that impact the love that we have in the Django world? I mean, that, so first of all, that's not quite accurate. Yeah. But I want you to, because I Adrian, know Adrian, that. Adrian founded the company and then had a baby. I think we, <laughs> what a, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's probably not Damn quite man. accurate either, but. <laughs> <laughs> the timeline may be compressed slightly. And, and the attribution of the activity of having the baby. It's true, yes. I'm pretty sure, for example, that his life was involved. <laughs> anyway, we're, we're here to discuss. So, so, so no, we're not out by But it's true, it's true that sort of, a, a, you know, a, Adrian and I have been sort of co BDFLs, and for a while, um, I've been you know, more or less speaking for both of us. Um, and he has sort of, um, he's wrangled some work time to work on Django and he's starting to sort of pick back up in the swing of things. And I, I mean, I just think that's awesome. Like I don't, um, I, I really think Adrian and I work really well as, as leads in that we have pretty different coding styles and pretty different impulses. And I think we, we balance each other pretty well. Like most of the time I've had to make a few times I've sort of had to make a hard decision in, you know, about Django, uh, and, or you know, do some sort of community, you know, call. I, I often do it by trying to sort of, you know, think about what I would do and then try to channel what I think Adrian would do. And, and if those if those two things line up, I feel pretty comfortable about my decision. And I think it's going to be a lot better for the whole community to have to have him involved and to have his his um, his voice and his taste. I mean. It, it, you know, Django is Adrian's baby, right? He 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 started it, he wrote it, he he the philosophy behind it, the design behind it is very much his. Um, you know, there's been a lot of contributors, but I do feel like it's you know I see Ad I see Adrian in Django's philosophy, and I I'm glad that that's I'm glad that he's found the time to sort of come back and contribute some more. I'm really I'm really excited <coughs> to see. What sort of you know neat stuff he he brings and what you know what new ideas he's having. I think it's gonna be awesome. Yeah. And for people who don't know Adrian, we've all talked about the Python community is really conservative. Adrian is considerably more of a cowboy. Do you agree with that? <laughs> well, he's willing to break down everything. Interesting. Everything it's interesting. So like you know he he isn't he isn't he isn't because he's not um, he doesn't he doesn't just like grab a ball and run with it and, and do something crazy just because no. he can. When he knows he has a better idea. He, he, he can, he can, he's very considered and he, he thinks a lot about his code before he writes it and, and as, a, as a consequence when he does he, he gets it he gets it right mostly on the first time. I mean you know one of the reasons that Django didn't have any tests when it was first open source is because Adrian kind of doesn't need them. Like, <laughs> like I, us. I wish I, like, I, Alex. I wish I was exaggerating but dude is like freakishly good at writing code. It's, it's kind of disturbing. Um, so, so you know, and yeah, when he when he gets an idea, he does most of it like that night and gets a huge amount gets a huge amount done really really quickly. So you know, I'm 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 excited. I'm really excited about that. I think it's a good I think it's a good role to have. You know, someone who is. We spend a lot of time thinking about backwards compatibility. It's a big deal. You know, it's a big deal for the community. I sometimes feel like the the grouch and like someone has a great idea and I go, no, it's not backwards compatible. It's going to be good to have, and, and, and that bugs that bugs Adrian. He wants to be moving forward. I think it's I think it's going to be good to have him, you know, saying, do we really need to be backwards compatible here? Come on, let's let's move forward. Who's so, really using Python to fly? We have to, right. We have to balance. I mean, we have to balance those things. There needs to be a balance there, and I think you know that's. I think it's good to have. <laughs> <laughs> we have a shift to five. We just went from two four to six. And he was telling us that he shifted to five. <laughs> Someone's spreading dirty rumors about Django. Is it? Oh, it is that bastard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so they were muttering about me. So they complained everything on the It's So easy. <laughs> you and Cisco stat are nowhere near as good as Duke's. <laughs> um, yes. Moving on. I just lost the question I was going to ask. Um, yes. So. In you guys' opinions, what are the things that are in Python that might not be as good as in other languages, and how can you get Python made up to do those? If there are such things. Yeah, Jacob touched on this in packaging, and the one thing, 
that I truly, truly, truly miss from the pro world is CMAN and the whole infrastructure around CMAN. You know, build bots, automatic tests run as part of install. You have to actually turn that off. The tests are run anytime you install anything. Sometimes you have test failures that you know you can skip, and it's not, it doesn't apply to you, but that kind of whole infrastructure, having the documentation and searching, you know, the, the little things. If you, go, if you go to the package index, what is, what's the most common thing you're going to do? Search for something, right? You know, you're going you're gonna to search for some. The focus on the page isn't in the search box. I can't just start typing. CPAN did that probably 10 years ago. Like the first time JavaScript would allow you to do that. You know, like that was like the third, you know, three days later, CPAN had that because it's terribly useful. And it's little small things that all roll up, you know, into a much, much better experience for packaging, as much as it still has also, you know, at least last time I used it, still had some problems and issues. But yeah, it, it's the light years ahead of what the Python world has. Greg and I were talking about this earlier, and I. I pointed out that it's, it's interesting to me that the pro community has sort of the reputation as the, you know, do anything you want, there are multiple ways to do it, whereas Python has the like one true way. And yet, when it comes to their packaging infrastructure, they're like, it's, op it's the opposite, right? There's like nine ways of installing packages on Python, right? And there's like 7,000 different ways of testing. But with CPAN, you, you type CPAN-I some module, and it gets downloaded, and it gets and the tests run regardless of what testing harness the people, you know, developing those packages have used. Like they've they've actually licked sort of the, the packaging testing installing problem in a remarkably unified <laughs> way. So I gotta think I gotta I'm think of Pearl I gotta understand. think of Pearl can do it. We we can do it. You know. If, if anybody <laughs> wants to volunteer to help work on this, let us know because that's the problem. Uh, short about resources. Um, that's the short version. I think two or three people maintain pipe right now. So, so I, and there is there is yeah. forward, there is a, a lot of forward progress actually in this in this area right now. There are people working on this right now. Yeah. So if you want us to connect you with some of them, oh, yeah. let, let us know. But yeah, so those are some of the bad things. They're going to harp on packaging on that long about them. So what are some of the cool things that you've seen come out as Python projects or Django projects in but you know. Have, have you seen the Python language? It's freaking <laughs> awesome! <laughs> <laughs> you can throw in every package and see what language works you. So, the fact that we have all these packages on top of it is like icing on the world's greatest cake. How many people here are Star Trek familiar, are familiar with Star Trek or familiar with pack lights? All right, all right, so, yeah, super deep. Uh, so, packlets pack are this race of space aliens that um, they, they, they don't have any creativity of their own. They just wander around and find good things and absorb them. Um, that's what Python is, right? It's like, there's some original art and there's some original thought there. I mean, Guido, Guido had a fantastic core idea. But when it comes to like the standard library or when it comes to like currency things, STM, et cetera, there's so much prior art that we should be the pack loads, right? We should be like, that's mighty shiny. I think I'll take one. You know, I mean, it, it, we, we should implement it the way that that makes sense. And we do, like the um, list current list, list comprehension just came from Haskell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, concurrent.futures, which is in Python 3. Um, concurrent.futures was modeled after Java. Uh, concurrent, uh, util current. Java namespace dot futures, right? And we should be doing more of this, and we do do a lot of this. Almost every one of the language features that have come in, like enhanced code, uh, enhanced generators, are prior art, and so it, it's nice to be able to look out there and say, hey, we'll take one of those, and everything's welcome, including in Django, and almost every web framework out there. I mean. There are good ideas that you can come up with on your own, but then look outside of yourselves and look outside of your own community and pull in what you can from elsewhere that makes good sense. Like, for example, there's lots of good ideas in Java, which is still more of it. Without so invoking cat <coughs> and or one thing that we one thing I'm proud of, really proud of about the Python community, I can't take any credit, just from, from the communities, is WSGI. Like yeah. we we laid the track there. Like Python as far as I know, basically invented WSGI, this concept of having 
an abstraction between the, the web application and the application container. And we did this in a lightweight, reasonably easy to use, you know, set of APIs, and, and all of the other dynamic languages are, are ripping us off. Right? There's Rack for Ruby, there's the terribly named Jack for JavaScript. I thought it was JSGI. Is that a thing That's about? even worse. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't they just call it Lord.js? Uh, I mean, they yeah. just pick random nouns. No, but, but like, it's being, I mean, we're, we're, we're being, we're being copied there, and that's you know that's the best sign that you've done something well, right? So I'm 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 inordinately proud that we've gone from a world where every single web application you had to read its deployment docs to figure it out to I can try out a new Python web stack and I don't even I know how to deploy it. Like there's a WSGI entry point, I point whatever server I want to be using at it, and 99% of the time it just works. This is act you know clearly I have a bias as a web developer, but this is actually really awesome. And it's a really, really cool thing that we invented ourselves, as far as I know, and have, have uh, let you know and let the world uh, copy. It's kind of cool. Well, I mean, it, largely these are based off of you know learning from other languages. It's like learning from jars, learning from wars, learning from Java deployment, learning from PHP deployment, and everything else like that. It's like, or it's kind of our job, you know, as toolsmiths inside the community, etc., <laughs> to learn from the mistakes of others and build something better as much as humanly possible, and that's kind of what we've always done. All right, so this one's a little bit more geared towards Alex, but one of my old students. It's all I hear all within day long is how awesome PyPy is, how fast it is, and how it's so much better than everything else. So why the hell am I not using it, and how do I get about using it, and you know, how many people are actually using PyPy as their world? Um, so the reason you're not using it right now is, is basically twofold. One is momentum. Any infrastructure change is a cost, and absent a clear reason for your use case, it would be, I guess, irresponsible to change because you just impose a cost on, you know, everyone using your website, everyone maintaining it, because you want to change the infrastructure to the shiny. And the other reason is because there are. Well, we are terrible marketers. <laughs> <laughs> He's being honest. Have you never worked with ops? Not having a show. You are not allowed to approach people for sponsorship. The other reason you're not using it is because uh, PyPy does not well support C extensions, which, as Jesse said, were for many a year how you did speed on uh, Python. The flip side of it is why you would use it today is because. Uh, some of you recently wrote a blog post called uh, the sweet spot. So about how languages have uh, different sweet spots. Wh how much of the language you can actually use if you want to write fast code. And uh, you know, they said C's sweet spot is huge. It's actually hard to write like a single line of code in C that's like really slow. And Java has a, I can do it. Uh, Java has a slightly smaller one, like most of Java's efficient, maybe kind of sorta if you don't mind the starter time. But C Python's sweet spot is pretty small. It's actually basically stuff that's actually written in C is pretty fast. And everything else is the PyPy project's chief aim has been to improve the sweet spot to improve code that is pure Python. And in that way I think we've really succeeded very well. If you go to speed.python. speed.pypy.org, that's our website. Uh, you can see benchmarks, and it's like we're five times faster on average over our arbitrary suite of those. And the reason you should use it for your project, your website, whatever, is it's not fast enough, and you, your dependencies work, and you've tested it, you've ran your tests, and it works because it's faster for your situation. There are, I don't like a count of people deployed, there are people with it deployed in production, serving millions and millions of web hits, and calculating. Money things. I, I don't know how to find out. You know, calculate money things. Or yeah. right, so how, ask how do you think things are like that? replacing C Python with like Pip and virtual end. You create a new virtual end using PyPy as the base Python. Install your dependencies and run your tests, and then run your benchmarks. So it's fairly painless. Yes. As long as you don't have any C extension. Yeah. And, the, there, and there are there are a few things that have 
So there's so there there are PyPy compatible MySQL bindings, yeah. right? That you wrote, right? For the, the I wrote PG. one, and there are other ones. And, as well. and there are also PsychoPG equivalent PsychoPG. There's one for every. So database. yeah, so so there for some PyPy. for some, and now there's NumPy, right? So for some yeah. C extensions, there are PyPy equivalents. Yeah. It's a similar situation to like porting to Python three, right? Where like or Python or you, pick, you figure out what your dependencies are, and as long as they're as long as they're done, you're you're kind of good to go. Well, one of the other aspects I, I think with PyPy uptake is we're actually going to see this is the same kind of tipping point argument that Python three has too, which is PyPy for a very long time was sort of an experiment. Research. And <laughs> Very researchy. Very. Um, and we're in the last couple of years, we're actually seeing the tipping point of where PyPy is beginning to gain more and more traction because it's kind of leaving the science lab, and more and more people are sitting there saying, "Wow, this actually makes my application faster. It uses more RAM, but it makes my application faster." Um, and I think we're going to be we're going to see that. And I think it's the job of like Python.org ultimately to actually help promote that. So when you go to download Python. It's like the PSF actually has a duty to actually say, hey, listen, you know, here's the, you know, here's C Python. It is the reference implementation. It is good for if you want to just learn Python, just download it, boom. Um, but then here's PyPy on the same page, and here's why you may want to use that. So a lot of it is marketing now that PyPy is becoming more and more mature. It's partially we have to get the word out and we have to put it up on python.org. We have to make it apparent that it is a first class citizen within the community. So quick question. Uh, so is it meant to grow parallel to, to Python, or is there, you know, do, do you see a future where PyPy becomes part of um, the, the, the typical distribution? Uh, so yes, right now our goal is to sort of sit parallel with CPython. CPython is Python's reference implementation. It's where new ideas become part of the language. And we don't see that changing in the short term future. It's our goal to be awesome at everything as much as possible. And so, yeah, that means hopefully someday we mean that we're, you know, when CPython has a new release, we have the same release a day later. You know, we're faster at anything you can throw at it. And then, you know, the way we win is by everyone wanting to have it installed. And I, we think the whole Python community wins that way. And from a second perspective, if we winning over CPython's developers is the other side of it. If one of the original ideas when PyPy was conceived was, in theory, if your Python is written in Python, it's easier for new people to come contribute to it. And we know there's a large perception that <coughs> PyPy is scary and magical and no one knows how it works. But it's, it's my personal goal that... That's definitely not true. There are at least three people who know how it works. They're all in the All right. So you got to... Oh, I was just going to say, tying back to the, the big tent, uh, Python and PyCon camp, any, anyone who's a developer for PyPy, uh, Jython, Iron Python, also has the commit bit for CPython. Um, yeah. And they all live together on python.org. And you know, there's no bad luck. Big tent. And fundamentally, to your, to your kind of like two branches of development type of thing, I don't think we're ever going to see PyPy replace CPython. And the reason why is that, believe it or not, while C Python, you know, isn't the fastest thing out there in the world, it's very simple. Um, like the eval loop, you can actually understand it. And from an embedding, in, from an embedding and porting standpoint, it's very easy to actually embed C Python and actually move it to other platforms. PyPy, not so much, not yet. Not yet. But I mean, it's C Python, despite you know some corner cases, is actually relatively simple. And so you're going to see these two branches because PyPy is going to be good at a whole host of things, and C Python will continue to be good at a whole host of things. Just as Jython and Iron Python are going to be good at a set of things, and it's good to have all of these interpreters because they cover, like for example, if you're in at EMC and you're in all Java shop or something else like that, the likelihood of you being being able to deploy PyPy or C Python is almost zero. Jython, on the other hand, you can deploy. Right? It'll just run inside a job. Have a nice day. Um, it's good to have these things, and it's good to actually have an ecosystem of interpreters that people can use. So, yeah. I'm a performance whore, and uh, you know, I, I really, I just kind of live for performance. And I think a lot of people, when they hear this is faster than this, 
um, they, they switch to it. And I think that you know once you know that sweet spot is bigger and easier, I think you're going to see more and more people switch over to that. I think you're going to see distributions have that be the default Python interpreter. You know, in a few years. Speaking of distributions, thanks to uh, Dave at uh, Red Hat and uh, Barry at uh, uh, Canonical, there's now packages for, I guess, Rattle and Fedora. Uh, yeah, for Fedora anyway. Yeah, yeah, okay. We can pass for Rails, and I probably should sort that out. Yeah, and the next Ubuntu release will hopefully have a PyPy package in it. So, awesome. Finally. So you don't have to do the translation yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or get through the LibSSL errors because you try to download the binding. Yeah. Well, you got to use the LTS. If it's in the next release, then it's in the LTS, which is awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to open it up a little bit to the audience. I do have the right to veto any of the MongoDB questions might get you beat up by the people. <laughs> but they're open to the floor, so go right ahead. Uh, question I was recently at a WordPress conference, and we were talking about Moodle, because uh, there are a lot of people from higher education there. And I'm curious what kind of learning management system would you recommend in Django or Python? I'm writing one right now, just to let you know. Yeah, it's not my world, sorry. I mean, <coughs> I mean we actually no. built one for a client recently, and we used uh, uh, was it Scorm Cloud, mm -hmm. uh, which has the whole player, and you just interact with it as an API. Sort of like a hosted service? Yeah, it's a hosted service, so all of the hard parts of Scorm uh, uh, is, is all encapsulated in that service, but you can build whatever you want then with Django and the APIs, and it's pretty, pretty simple. Really. But I don't know of any actual bait. You know, does, 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 oh. does, does anyone in this room? Not sure. So, uh, what's this? Oh. I'm running the show here on the end, Jacob. <laughs> what's the very smallest you could ever make a Python interpreter, and could you stuff it up on the GPUs? Someone, someone's yes. done that. Yeah. There, 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 are, there are, actually, if you do a Google search, there are tons of tiny Python interpreters out there. They've got them embedded in robots. Uh, robots. <laughs> I'm, getting ready to, I'm getting ready to buy a house, and somebody was telling me that there's a, like a home automation controller that has like Python. So yeah. everywhere. So we actually had Python. There's, a talk, there's, a talk, there's, a talk, there's actually a talk at PyCon, come to PyCon, there's a talk at PyCon on um, embedding on, on Python on a Embedded device. There's one called Snappy. Have you heard of that? Yeah, Snappy, there's Tiny Pie, there's Yeah. Pie. They've yeah. gotten it like very small, like oh, in the UK, small. Oh, that's so. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But also, if you're interested in GPUs, it's for numerical stuff. I know there are libraries that work with NumPy that make oh. NumPy happen on GPUs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pocus and a few others. Yeah. Right. There's someone. So, uh, do you see software transactional memory hitting PyPy in the next couple of years? Or? Yeah, uh, I do. So, Armin Rigo, there was recently a PyPy sprint this past week in Switzerland, and Armin Rigo spent most of it hacking on STM, which, those who don't know, is basically the way your database has transactions. It's basically the same idea for Python, and it's a way to remove the GIL or global interpreter lock, which prevents multiple threads from executing simultaneously in Python for both <coughs> Python and PyPy. And so he's been, Arvin's been working on this STM implementation for PyPy. And today he said that he's got it down to, if you run with a single core, it's now only uh, eight times slower. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me, let me, let me sorry, finish. No, no, no. <laughs> well, I want to tell a story about it, because Please. they have a story, it's funny. Okay, so I've been going to PyCon for a long time. And the first, the first year I went to PyCon, I, I lost track of how many, like eight years, seven years, something. The first time I went to PyCon, Someone gets up and gives a talk on PyPy, and it was basically, hey, look, we built Python and Python, and it's only ten times slower. And everyone, was the ten times, and everyone cracked up, and it was, and you know, and it was a joke. And you know, the first year, the first few years of PyCon, every year they'd be like, hey, use PyPy, it's only ten times slower, and everyone would be like, well, yeah, whatever. Like PyPy was this big joke, ten times slower. Why, why would I use like, why would you write Python and Python? That's impossible. It's never going to work. It's ten times slower. And then. A few years ago, there was that same talk, and you should use PyPy, it's only five times slower. Because we're like, yeah, whatever, it's only five times slower. And then the next year is you should use PyPy, it's only about 50% slower. And then the next year is you should use PyPy, it's the same speed. And this year it's you should use PyPy, it's five times faster. And they so, got $10,000 So, you know, like, we laugh at STM eight times slower, but 
I don't know, given their track record, I wouldn't be surprised to see them be able to deliver some serious performance games on this. So, so. the talk Jacob missed is the year before he was there, apparently. Uh, I thought it was 2,000 times. <laughs> <laughs> I'll include that next time. That's a bad story. <laughs> but uh, the, the nice thing about Armin's experiment is it's eight times slower on one chord. But he's demonstrated linear scaling up to like four cores. So four cores are is just twice as slow, and he thinks there's just inordinate room for improvement in all the cases. So and these are really smart guys. No, yeah. Armin is special. Armin has carries a brain in a sling. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the PSF should take out like insurance on exactly. his brain. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to take it on his hair, but then he Any other questions? Sir? What, what do I need on my uh, Android tablet to be able to record a Python program? So there's kind of two ways of doing Python on Android, right? Way one is like the official way, which is Android scripting layer. Scripting yes, language, yeah. As, as, yeah, scripting languages for Android. It's terrible. It's a, it's a, it's basically like a sandbox. You get like a window with a list of your scripts, and you, you and you tap like myscript.py, and it runs. It's the worst user interface you could possibly imagine. You can't deliver apps with it. You can't. That's don't don't even don't even waste your time. Um, the the way. The, the other way, and the way that has to happen, is essentially a cross-compiler that will compile Python into Dalvik bytecode, so that it'll, it will be, be Java, um, and, and you know, essentially what Jython is doing. I understand that someone has actually just, that for a long time that didn't exist for, for Python, it did for a few other languages, but not for Python, but I understand that someone has just gotten it working. Um, I, I can't recall what it's called, but um, that's, it's still kind of in its infancy, I don't, I don't yet know. And I don't know what Google's policies is going to be with regard to like, because you're essentially embedding a Python interpreter when you distribute an app that way. And I, I'm fairly sure Apple would never let that happen. I, I don't know what Google's <coughs> policies are going to be on that. You know, Actually, Joe Apple Bruce changed, changed it. Yeah, they, they oh, it was good. Was good. Yeah, you just can't you run user created or network to okay. no oh, cool. Yeah, so, yeah, and, and Android, of course, you can always, you know, you know go around that. So I, I think I think it's probably probably not quite there yet, but I, it sounds it sounds like it's on its way. As uh, as for actually getting a first class Python support inside of Android, I don't know when that's going to happen because they've been talking about that for years and it has yet to it, it has yet to materialize. So a cross compiler is probably going to be the only bet. Any other questions? Have you guys ever done this or uh, heard of anyone uh, doing this, uh, booting a Linux kernel straight into the Python? So James Tauber, who is uh, one of the Django core developers, who's on the board of the PSF, stuff like that, actually started a project basically doing that, creating an OS kernel that was 99% in Python. So <coughs> on the ground up. And I have no idea how far it is. I'm sure you have absolutely no time to work on it most days. It's a ridiculous project. Um, I have no idea if there's been any. Well, it's only 2,000 times slower. The old PC did No, I mean, we'll, we'll like no, I'm yeah, sorry? The old PC is all written in Python. Not the kernel. Yeah, the kernel. Uh, I'm uh, what sure I mean, the whole thing, seriously, including like device drivers. Kernel, what I mean is that, that, that you run you, wrong. you run your Linux kernel. <laughs> you run your Linux kernel, but, but instead, you, in you instead of in it, you run your Python uh, program. This, I think it's something like that for... You pretty much throw away and anything you don't need, like screw the, you know, the, the demons and <laughs> uh, the, the, the processes and, you know, all of the junk that I don't need. Like, for a specific application, uh, you could pretty much just run it straight into Java or Python or anything else. It sounds it like you should look into Dave sugar. It looks like you know something about this. No, no, I was just going to say, oh, you see the UI is in Python, but... Okay. So. <coughs> I, I'm pretty sure FreeBSD is something like what you just described, but it's like for Lua. So I guess it's possible, as far as I get. Uh, so, um, no. <laughs> what, what's the status of uh, programming, build programming with data arrays and HDL? <laughs> Come on, that's a Django topic, that's right? That, as, as, a, as someone with a literature degree, I feel um, <laughs> highly qualified to answer that question. Sorry. These guys know a lot. They don't know everything. Does anyone know? I don't know half the worst that this means. If you pay me a lot of money, I can find out. <laughs>
I can't really just do it in C. So, like, I mean, there, there are people who have tried to make C to FPGA compile, you know, like development environments, but it's, it's a very restricted subset. It's, it's, a, it's a totally different paradigm for, like, designing a sort of logic circuits, you know, that are concurrent. It's just totally different. Go ahead. Um, wasn't there a project called Unladen Swallow, which is? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It was. Uh, so repeat the question. Yeah, there was a question about. It was asking what isn't. Wasn't there a project called Unladen Swallow? Um, yeah, it, it was a um, Unladen Swallow was a Google project. It was a, a couple of engineers at, at Google, and it was um, an attempt to basically. Um, uh, Retrofit um, um, LLVM um, into into C Python and get some performance improvements. Um, the, the sort of the good news is they found they found a lot of performance improvements and that came back into into Python. Um, the one that always sticks in my memory is pickling performance improved by like some ridiculous like 24 or something ridiculous. Independent of the LLVM work. <laughs> right. Well, no, that's, that's what I'm getting to. Right. They found a bunch. They found a bunch of optimizations quite separate from the LLVM one. The Bad news was that basically LLVM is not, from what I understand, wasn't baked enough really to, for this to be possible. And there was the added problem of what Jesse said earlier of CPython being very simple and LLVM being not. And so it, it was ultimately it was ultimately abandoned. Um, it translated into, into some performance wins for Python as a whole, but it's it, it's it, the, the the parrot is dead. <laughs> uh, yeah. Before I converted to PyPy, I worked on Unlaid and Swallow, and it died in my view for two reasons. One is Google stopped sponsoring it, um, which was basically the reason it existed in the first place. And the second reason was a combination of LLVM wasn't ready for the way Unlaid and Swallow wanted to use it, and the approach taken sort of retrofitting CPython with this JIT wasn't, it was generating a lot of maintenance work very, very quickly. So it wasn't a very good long-term approach. They spent most bye -bye wins. They spent most of their time actually working on LLVM yeah. Yeah. versus working on Python. Yeah. And that, that once you hit kind of that threshold, I mean, I'm sure even a company like Google only has a tolerance so much, which is we expected you to have a 5x performant Python. And then, you know, a year later or so. They have a GED like, that supports debugging all of the ideas. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so it's like, we, did good, we, but, spent, uh, we spent the last year shaving a yak, and I'm sure you know Google it's a very said, pretty yak. Yeah. It's actually pretty funny though, because their, their original goal was a 5x speed up in about two years, and it's two years later, and we have a Python that uses a JIT and is five times faster. It's just not the one that they thought they were making it with. <laughs> but, but to that point, I actually have to credit the Unladen Swallow guys for actually so. PyPy Science Lab, some of the, I don't want to their benchmark suite. Yeah. yeah it's, we saw the path they blazed with making the community run faster Python. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that came out of Unlaid and Follow that benefited the community. Yeah. But also one of it, was, one of the things is, is that it actually helped spur PyPy to move faster. Yeah. And that probably <coughs> is going to be the biggest long-term benefit mm -hmm. that Unlaid and Follow did, which is, all of a sudden, yeah. Now, now instead of PyPy being five times slower, now all of a sudden, you know, with this uh, added adrenaline rush and, frankly, competition, um, we now have a much, much different landscape. Uh, the last question. Uh, do you guys use a, a common IDE or, or tool suites between all of you, or is there a common thread there? I thought we all use different things. <laughs> I use PyCharm. PyCharm. <coughs> what do you use? Jesse. What do you use? Ben. 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 Vim. Vim and Sublime. Oh, no. <laughs> There's a little bit of agreement though. Mm -hmm. So, 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 you, yeah. so you, do you, know, you guys yeah. in Sublime, you use the VIP bindings? Maybe. They <laughs> 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 kind of common ground. They go, oh, 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 happened oh. this week, actually. Yeah. PyCharm is, if you're looking for an IDE experience as opposed to a text editor, I mean, what? Mike used an idea, the rest of us all use, you know, more classically nerdy text editors. I used editors. to use Emacs for a long time. Yeah, if you're, that if was you're, a J edit, now I'm in PyCharm. If you're looking for an, a, for an IDE, I've, I'm not an IDE guy, but the one I've liked the most has been PyCharm. Especially if you're doing Django work, it's got some really nice Django integration hooks. Makes it so pretty Sublime has been growing closer to an IDE without feeling bloaty, though. So.
you've got like clever auto and things like that. I make sure to use Dvorak because it uh, accelerates your. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to literally do math. It accelerates my typos. Hey, those need to be fast. If anybody in here is a, a Windows user, um, I work for Microsoft, which is Windows 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 other pipe, they work with every pipe on the stock of Python. Oh, sweet. Right. So, I think we're getting close to wrapping it up here. So, what I want each one of you to do is just give a couple minutes on a topic that you want to talk about uh, in the office. And I'm going to cut you short because I know you're going to go on yeah. blathering. We'll go to Jacob last. We'll start with Jesse. Um, I'll do it for him. Register for PyCon before midnight. <laughs> Actually, just come to PyCon. I mean, it's going to be a blast. It's, it, I got, it, one of the cool things about working on PyCon is I get phone calls from all over the world. And I have to pick up the phone. I, I no longer, I can't define telemarketers or anything else like that because I'm literally getting calls from like, People that want to give me money. People, it's like, it's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like I, I pick up the phone and it says Paris, France. I'm like, I don't know anyone in France, and I pick it up and come to find out it's a sponsor, and they make this cool little robot called the NAO oh, robot. I knew he was going to talk about that. It, it's about it's that tall, awesome. right? And, and I'm like, why am I on the phone with a robotics company? What, what do you want? They're like, oh, yeah, you can program it in Python. I was like, I'm sold. Give me two. <laughs> right? And uh, so, I mean, it's Python's going to be huge, and we get to give away one of these one of these little robots. I mean, they're like, if you're not a developer, they're worth like ten, fifteen thousand dollars. I mean, the, these little robots. Yeah, I, I know we're not eligible. Yeah, I'm not eligible, <laughs> yeah, I'm not eligible oh. on staff. But I mean, it's I like mean, you're not eligible either. But I am. Python, is really honestly going to be huge. Like we've got, we've got probably the best tutorial lineup that I've ever seen. We've got the, the talk selection this year was abysmally diffi difficult because we had so many amazing talks. Three, over 300 submissions, we get to pick 90? 95. 95, right? Mine wasn't picked again. No, 350 <laughs> submissions, 95 slides. Right, I mean, it's going, to be, it's going to be great. And I mean, with the with the attendance that we're looking at right now, the sprints, assume 40% of the people are going to stay. We're looking at 600 sprinters. I believe two of the tutorials are almost sold out already. Is that what I just thought it would to? Oh, no tutorials sold out. No? I that would assume there's a cap. Oh, yeah, there you go. I must have missed it. So maybe he's just trying to draw some interest. Yeah, in yeah. yeah. Okay. that's marketing. <laughs> all right. Uh, no. so, so. I was just going to ask you, you saying about all the talks. Is, it, is any of that stuff going to be recorded? Or yeah. Every talk is Yeah, all the talk proper will be recorded and will be like up on the web. Yeah. Last year and the year before right. and the year before that. Uh, if you go to python.miro, M-I-R-O community.org, you can actually see an archive of all, every JangoCon, almost every JangoCon, lots of user group, uh, Pi Ohio, PyCons going back several years. You can see the entire video archive. Every talk will be recorded. No tutorials will be recorded. Keynotes will be recorded. We've got Paul Graham giving a keynote, Stormy Peters and others. Um, so all of that will be looking, And we're looking at streaming. I don't necessarily know. The cost has been an issue. And if, and if it remains an issue, it's going to keep going. You don't want to know. If it remains an issue, it's so going to keep going. So if you own a streaming company, company out there, but, talk to us. But, the, but we, we've, we've traditionally gotten the videos up like within days, um, and sometimes you know the next day. Like and, and it's part of our we, we we hammer on our recording companies that like we want it up as quickly as humanly possible. Like yeah. The limitation, limiting factor would be how fast you can transfer. All right, so yes, they will be recorded and they'll be on. That'll be awesome. Paul, uh, awesome. you mentioned Glyph before. Yeah. Does he, does he his Django talk or something? Would that be at the same place? It'll be at yeah. the same place, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. He'll also be at the project night on February 8th, so you can just go and hector him about it, person <laughs> if you want. Yeah, well, Alex, <laughs> you're up. <laughs> so my pitch is just build something with Python preferably. We have an overflow of really, really cool stuff in Python. Like, I see people saying, you know, no JS event and stuff. Like, no, no, Twisted did that a decade ago. Like, I want Python to be on the cutting edge of every cool thing because we have a language that 
I think is fun to use, which is more than I can say for just about every other language I've played with. Like Python is some, so, somehow intrinsically fun to work with. It doesn't bring my day down, like when I have to like open a C file. So <laughs> I want every cool idea that it's possible to be built in Python. If it's not possible to build in Python today, I, I want to know why, because I want to make our infrastructure better. I want to, I want to have the best of everything. I want, I want to expand Python's sweet spot so that Python is like your first choice for any project you can possibly conceive of for any reason. And that means building all sorts of cool stuff, cool tools, cool projects, cool frameworks. So just get out there and build something. Um, I don't know if everybody's familiar with it. Um, this is a Python project called Fabric for doing uh, kind of automating system tasks. It is really, really neat. And it really will save you a lot of time. And I've started to get in the habit of, if I do this thing twice, I start writing fabric tasks for it. And then I don't have to remember how it works or which host I was supposed to connect to to do those couple of things. And so it makes, especially my work as a consultant, where I work you know, sometimes in four or five different projects in the same day, keep all that stuff straight. And I can imagine a lot of you who maybe haven't played with it could really benefit from kind of you know, the best documentation of the process is here's the code that does it. You know. Jacob, 30 seconds. Quick. So how, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate again how crappy marketers we are. Uh, how many people here are, are Django users? And, and of you guys, how many have used other Python frameworks? That's good, that's, that's most of you. So for those of you who haven't, if you use Django, if it's the only Python web framework you use, I want you to go out and try another one. I'll mention two. Um, Pyramid is the sort of reborn pylons. It's um, kind of the, the bigger, more megalithic framework, but it's done in a sort of more component architecture style that you swap out ORMs and swap out templating languages. It's kind of neat. Flask is Ooh. a very small, lightweight, um, you know, essentially you know, web app in a file type, type framework and let, lets you really, really quickly crank out little toys um, and, 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 put them, and put them up. They're both super neat. They have all sorts of ideas I can't wait to steal and put in Django and you try it out. <laughs> Flask. 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 Yeah, it's really awesome. Um, so I'm just going to close this up here because I'm getting thirsty and I can't talk anymore. I want to personally thank both Jessica and Ned for helping put this all together. <laughs>